So, well, the show American Idol is over. It's done. We're finally through with Ryan Seacrest, at least until his next show comes on. So the show American Idol is over, but that doesn't mean that idols in America are over. There are plenty of idols still around America, in American culture. There's also plenty of idols still around in mall culture. And, and it's, that's why we gotta talk about them. We're doing this series now called Mall American Idols. Facing the counterfeit gods of our cultures. American culture has got them, and mom culture has got them. And so last week I started with a question. I started with a question to say, what is an idol? And the Bible has two definitions for that. Two definitions for the question of what is an idol. First, it's anything you put ahead of God. Anything you put ahead of God. Or second, an idol is what you turn to when you think God isn't coming through. Whenever you're getting disappointed with God and the thing you turn to, that's kind of your counterfeit God. That's your idol. Okay. So if you missed last week, we have some video problems and we haven't gotten up online yet. But we'll hopefully be caught up and get that up online this week, so I apologize for that. Um, but, but you can catch up on last week's sermon, hopefully this coming week, on what is an idol. So now, today, I want to talk about what I believe to be the top American idol, which is me. Yes, I, Greg Rhodes, am the top American idol. Okay. But the top American idol is me, is the individual. America is the land of me. It's the me first world here in the West. And, and so we, we kind of got, we, we have to start there. So here. Um, I, so in researching this, I ran across a fascinating website. Okay, fascinating website. I got a picture of it. It's called the International Guide, International Student Guide to the U.S. So it's a website for international students from students from non-U.S. citizens who are coming to the U.S. to study. Maybe they're coming for college, on an exchange program in high school, coming here for grad school, and it's to tell non-Americans about America. My favorite page out of the whole site was this one on, that listed American culture and values. It was like American Culture's 101. And, and, and it listed out eight major American values. You know what number one on the list was? Individuality. And so I actually wanted to read you their description of American, the American value of individuality. Americans are encouraged at an early age to be independent and develop their own goals in life. They are encouraged to not depend too much on others. They are rewarded when they try hard to reach their goals. So doesn't that sound like your childhood? What, no? <laughs> you didn't grow up like this? This is exactly my childhood. That perfectly described the world I grew up in. I could go to any college that I wanted. In fact, my parents encouraged me to go to any college that I wanted to. Even if it meant 3,000 miles away from home, my parents encouraged me to do that. Okay? Um, I, I was never pressured to follow a particular career. I'm sure that's the same with you as well, wasn't it? <laughs> I was never, in fact, my, my, my dad's a lawyer. He was a very successful real estate lawyer back in the day. And he even told me explicitly, he said, don't be a lawyer. It's terrible. You hate it. Don't be a lawyer. But my parents never pressured me to follow and pursue a particular job, a career. They let, they let me choose 100% the direction that I wanted to go. Okay? At 16, when I got an earring without my parents' notice or permission, okay, yes, it's true, I had an earring at 16. You can actually even come see the scar, you can, you can see evidence of it. Um, so when I got an earring at 16, in a tent in Mexico on a missions trip with church, my dad completely objected to it, but he let me keep it because it was my choice. That's American individualism. That's the, that is the American way you put yourself first and you make yourself the most important thing. Now, okay, I mean, I know that is likely not the family you grew up in. <laughs> okay? Now, next week, we're going to talk about the topic, Mong Idol of Saving Face. 
Now that's probably the family you grew up in. But we gotta talk about the, the American Idol, because even though it's not the family you grew up in, for most of you, it's the country you grew up in. Which means it's inside you. This value has seeped in. Despite your parents' best efforts, the priority, the prioritization of the self is inside every one of us. It just takes up a whole lot more space inside me. <laughs> you guys got to have this split idol world that you live in. Okay? So, so this individualism that is just primed in America, we've got to talk about this. What does it look like to turn yourself into an idol? To make yourself more important than God? Well, let's go back to our definition. Okay? Remember our definition, the Bible has two definitions for what an idol is. So when we, when we apply it to ourself, it can mean one, when you put yourself ahead of God. It means your goals, your desires, your activities, ahead of God's goals, God's desires, God's activities. So that's one definition of what it could look like for to put yourself as an idol. The second definition is when you feel God isn't coming through, when you feel God is distant, when you get upset with God, you take things into your own hands. And you say, okay, God, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have to become the God here and do what I want to do. And fundamentally, it's when self-interest drives your life. It's when self-interest drives your life. You ignore the parts of the Bible you don't really like or you don't agree with. You only go to church when you want to. And on those mornings, you're a little tired, a little hungover, a little just like you want to spend the time in bed and just like, yeah, I forget church. Okay? Or you do things, your choices become driven on what feels good in the moment. Any of those are what it looks like when you turn yourself into an idol. It's making yourself the highest priority in your life. You become the counterfeit God. And trust me, we make terrible gods. God makes a pretty darn good God, we make terrible ones. And we gotta watch out because the Bible has really strong words about the counterfeit gods we set up in our, in our lives. We talked about some of those very strong words. In fact, the entire law the entire, was started with, you shall have no other gods before me. And that includes yourself. Okay? So the Bible has strong words about what it means, what it looks like to elevate the self above everything else. And so today we're going to look at one of Jesus' defining passages. This really, this is a fundamental passage to the Christian life. In fact, it is so fundamental, if you miss this, you might actually be missing the entire thing. You don't get this right, it's unlikely you can kind of get anything else right about the Christian life. Right? That, that's why it is so important. And now this passage we're going to look at from Jesus, one of Jesus' teachings, um, I'll, I'll tell you the structure up front. He starts out with a thesis statement. Okay, we all remember our thesis statements. It's the, the thing you're talking about, the beginning of the, the paragraph. And then he gives four reasons. Four reasons. <laughs> Clearly, I needed some more coffee this morning, okay? He gives four reasons why that thesis statement is true. Hey, sounds like a good high school paper, doesn't it? Okay, throw a little, like, one line cheesy conclusion and submit it to your AP English class. Okay? So here we go. So this is out of Mark 8, the passage that we're going to look at. And we're going to start with his thesis statement. Ready? Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Okay, so this is the, the thesis, the, the statement that he's making. And it applies to anyone. Because notice, he, he gathered his disciples, but he also gathered the crowd. And he said, okay, if any of you 
want to follow me. If any of you want to, the ESV translates as come after me. If any of you want to follow me, if any of you want to be my disciple, if any of you want to call yourself a Christian, okay? Jesus wouldn't use that term because that term didn't exist yet, but we use that term so we can throw it in. If any of you want to, want to be a Christian, here's what you got to do. First, deny yourself. You have to deny yourself. Fundamentally, this means saying no to yourself and yes to God. No to yourself and yes to God. This is putting Jesus ahead of yourself. Now, this is not self-denial, which is like the, the, the ascetic gurus who live out in the desert and eat like cactus leaves and scorpions and that's all they're allowed to eat. And they, punish, they smack themselves with cactus leaves to punish themselves. Okay, that's that, that ascetic life of, of punishment and sacrifice and denial. That's not what this is. Okay? In fact, this word deny yourself, one of, one of my favorite definitions as I, I was looking at this Greek word for deny, does not mean pretend it doesn't exist. Okay, because that just doesn't work. Be like, I deny you exist. Okay? That's not, that's not what this means. Okay, what this actually means, this is the same context as if you're familiar with the story of Peter after Jesus was arrested, or if you're here during our Easter service, when Peter denied Jesus three times, same word. So Peter did not say Jesus does not exist. What Peter said was, I don't know him. I'm not a part of him. He's a stranger to me. So this word deny yourself actually means more about distancing yourself from yourself. My favorite definition as I was reading through the, the different definitions for this Greek word, here it is. To refuse to pay attention to what your own desires are saying. To refuse to pay attention to what your own desires are saying. Notice this doesn't mean you live on saltines and water every day. That's, that's self-denial. But denial of self means I want to eat the whole chocolate cake. I'll just have a sliver. Okay? Your desires are saying eat the whole chocolate cake. You deny those and say I'll just have a sliver. Versus I'll eat saltines and water for every meal. So deny yourself. Second thing he says, take up your cross. Take up your cross. Now, this was a, typically, I mean, this sounds kind of like an idiom, like one of those little phrases that people know, but this was actually unknown. This phrase was not used before in his context. But everyone who was there would have known what he was talking about. Because Roman crucifixions were fairly common around Jerusalem, and they would have seen people, much like Jesus did, they would have seen accused, condemned prisoners carrying the large crossbar down the road to the place where they were going to get executed. This carrier cross is the point between when you are sentenced to death and when you die. Carrier cross means that stretch of road. And you actually physically had to carry the crossbar, the 20, 30 pound beam of wood to the place where they were going to nail or tie you to it. So, so when Jesus said, take up your cross, it means you have to put yourself in that position. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never, I've never seen someone like walking down rice carrying a giant cross beam, unless they were coming from Home Depot or something and their car broke down. Um, but so I want to modernize it a little bit. Take up your cross, because that's the other thing, like, Christ, like Christians, especially Christian bumper stickers, love little Christian phrases, and this is one of those little Christian phrases that I think has gotten a little um, glorified and glamorized, so let me modernize it a little bit. Accept your death penalty. Accept your death penalty. If you want to follow Christ, you have to deny yourself and accept your death penalty. Now, chances are that doesn't mean, like any of us, it's unlikely that any of us would actually have to give up our life for Christ. Other parts of the world, that's a very real thing. 
But it does mean, it does mean that there is a death to yourself. Okay? So third, he says, follow me. And this actually wraps it up for, to the beginning of the sentence as well. Because this is sort of the same word as if you want to come after me, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, he's saying, then follow me. If you want to follow me, then follow me. And so, have you ever sat across a friend of yours who, if you're a Christian, you sit across a friend and they're a Christian and, and, and they're talking about stuff and they're doing stuff and you're like, okay, dude, Christians just should not be doing this. Do you ever feel like just saying, you know what, if you want to follow Jesus, follow Jesus. You've got to stop doing what you're doing. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying. He's reiterating his first point and wrapping it up into a nice little tight sandwich right there. So if you want to follow Jesus, then follow Jesus. Don't sort of half it around, if you get my drift. If you want to follow Jesus, you follow Jesus. Okay, let's continue. Now, all of this, this first section can be summed up, I think it can be summed up with the following phrase. Following Jesus means accepting your death sentence. Following Jesus means accepting your death sentence. But, it's a little more than a physical death sentence. So I'll modify it. Following Jesus means accepting your death to self sentence. And if you aren't willing to put yourself to death, you might quite, not quite be willing to be following Jesus. Because following Jesus means accepting your death to self sentence. Not convinced yet? Jesus actually gives four reasons why this is true. Four reasons why this is the best way to live. Four reasons why we should buy into this. Buy into this death to self sentence. Okay? So, so let's start with reason number one for the next verse. Now, all of these begin with the conjunction for. Remember, conjunction, conjunction, what's your function? School has rock. Now, how old am I here? Okay? Yeah. So, all of them begin with the conjunction for. Now, this also can mean, think of it as because. I sometimes think because is a little easier to read. So, all of these are because statements. Here we go. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. You've got to put more focus on yourself. All right, sorry. Put less focus on yourself. And here's, here's, here's what Jesus is saying. Is that the more you focus on yourself, the more you lose. That's the paradox of the Christian life. It's, it's like bizarro Superman world here. Okay? It's, it's alternate flash. I was just watching the flash last night. So, okay? It, it, it's, it's bizarre rule. It's alternate flash. Okay? Then it's the opposite of what you think. The more you pour into yourself, the more you lose. And the less you focus on yourself, the less you make your life wrapped up around your goals and your desires, the more you win the more you actually save yourself, okay? That is the exact opposite of what America will tell you. Donald Trump will never sit up at the podium and say, take a back seat to somebody else. Sacrifice your will for somebody else's good. No, Donald will never tell that, okay? We all know what Donald T will say. You look out for number one. You take care of yourself first. Screw the little guys. You watch out for yourself. You protect yourself, your family, your interests, your businesses, your life, your passions. And you lose. And that's one of the amazing paradoxes of Christian life. The more you focus on yourself, the more you lose. That's reason number one. You don't want to trade temporary benefits 
for an eternal place with God. Okay? So let's go to number two. And now, the NIV actually doesn't, they translate these fours differently, the four, the because. Um, but in the Greek, the, the ESV actually translated it, I think, better in this one. So I've, I've added little fours in here. They aren't in the original NIV, but they are in the original Greek. Okay? To tell you, that's why he, each one of these is a, def, is a is it because, it's a reason. So here we go. For what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? What good is it to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? Reason number two is living for yourself doesn't feed your soul. It feeds your flesh. It feeds this body we live in. But we got, what, 70, 80 good years with this body? And our soul lives for an eternity. So what, what Jesus is saying here is for the... the when you spend all of your energy focusing on yourself, you're actually making a really terrible trade. You're trading what is temporary for what is eternal. The more you focus on one, the more you lose the other. We trade this temporary life that we're living, even a temporary day, we trade for an eternal soul. That's reason number two. It's a terrible trade. Reason number three, go to the next verse. Again, for or because, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Okay. Really, I mean, what could you trade? What, what could possibly trade the eternal value of a soul? There's nothing more valuable than that. And when we pour our energy into ourselves, when we make ourself the big deal in life, our soul gets neglected. And if it gets neglected enough, our soul, we could actually lose an eternal place with God. Reason number three, nothing is more valuable than our soul. And in God's economy, when we put ourselves below God, He feeds our souls. Our souls thrive. That's how God's economy works. That's reason number three. Let's talk reason number four. Reason number four. Now here he goes a little longer. For, or because, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Okay, we just upped the, the, like the Christian language here a little bit, so let's, we'll, we'll take a step back. Is that not a little weird for you? If you're like, I'm not sure what's going on here. Okay, I'll sort of summarize. Jesus, that, that phrase, Son of Man, is a, a phrase, it's an Old Testament reference that Jesus loved to refer to for himself. It's a Messiah reference. So he says, when I come back, and all that language of glory to the Father and the holy angels and all of that, all of that is symbolic language to represent when Jesus Christ returns to judge all of us. So this is a reference to Judgment Day. Okay? And not the Terminator movie, the actual Judgment Day that will be happening sometime in the future. Okay? So that's what this is. So now, let's talk about this word ashamed. What is, what is this word ashamed? Okay, this is not like, oh, I'm so embarrassed by my dad. Oh, I wish he'd just go away. No. Okay, that's not, that's not what this ashamed means. Okay? What well, this, in the Bible, this ashamed actually means a lot more, it's a lot more um, uh, similar in definition to the idea of denying. So shame re refers to denial or disloyalty. Okay. So it's like when Peter denied Jesus, he didn't deny that he existed. He denied association with Jesus. In a sense, he was ashamed to be called and connected and associated and friends with Jesus. 
So this word, that's kind of what this word ashamed means. It's not what we really think it means. So I've, I've modernized it a little bit. Here's what it, here's what it might, it could mean a little easier modern that, okay? Whoever denies loyalty to me in this messed up world, I will deny loyalty to them in my perfect world. That's kind of what this is saying. Okay, all of a sudden, Jesus kind of upped the game here a little bit. This is no longer just something nice to do on earth. <laughs> Could this possibly actually have eternal consequences? There are only a handful of things that Jesus explicitly connects to where we spend eternity, with God or apart from God. And this is one of them. And that's why I said that if you don't get this, if saying no to yourself is not a part of your Christian life, it might possibly mean that your Christian life is not all that Christian. And it might actually mean you're not even Christian. That's why I want to say, if you miss this, kind of miss it all. That's how important this is. That, that Jesus says that how, what we do with ourself and our self-interest can actually have eternal consequences. I mean, that's pretty scary. That makes it a lot more serious than Jesus just wants me, me to be good and nice to people. Okay? That's not what this is about. It's a lot. Your soul is actually on the line here. It's not optional. There's no place in God's kingdom for a self-obsessed Christian. There's just no place for it. And Jesus has some pretty straight up words in response to that. So what do we do? We're, we're living in America. Most of you will probably continue to grow up in America, and which means the longer you stay here, the more American individualism is going to hammer down on you. The more movies you, we watch, the more TV we watch, the more we read, more that, that American individualism, this, this elevation of self, will get driven into all of our minds. So what do we do? How can we resist turning American individualism into an idol in our life? Okay. How can we refuse to let self-interest drive us? What do we do? Well, we can't let ourselves take the place of Christ. Okay? Remember all the first definition of an idol? They need to be placed above Christ. Right? Which means our self, everything about us, everything we want, all of our dreams, all of our hopes, all of that has to go underneath Christ. Which means we also got to know Christ's hopes and goals. What are God's values in life, in relationships, in marriage, in kid raising? What's important to God? We have to kind of know that. Otherwise, we're most likely we're just going to take our own stuff and say that's what God likes also. Okay? That's not the way it works. That's the first thing we've got to do. The second thing we've got to do, remember the second definition? That an idol is what we turn to when we think God is coming through. So the second kind of second definition, we've got to pay attention to the times we feel God isn't coming through for us. We've got to pay attention when we feel that God has abandoned us or he's taken too long, or he's left us. Because those are the times we are most at risk of turning ourselves into a little bit, a little idol. So I found this quote in one of the books that I was reading for this, this one, and, and, and I love it because I, I think it captured this, this issue of what do we need to do. I think it captured this issue really well. And I, I, I changed some of the language because it used some, some kind of some older English language. It was a little, a little weird. So I, I, I made it a little simpler for all of us thick headed folks to understand. And I want to read to you. I'm just going to put it up on the screen as well. Okay? So what does this mean? For some, it may mean leaving a job 
and family as the disciples did. For the proud, it means giving up the desire for status and honor. For the greedy, it means rejecting the love of money. The lazy will have to renounce their love of comfort. The fearful will have to discard their craving for security. The angry will have to abandon their desire for revenge. Chances are, most of us can probably fall into one of those. The proud, the greedy, the lazy, the fearful, the angry. Chances are every one of us in here has got a God that they've set up. A God of self. So what part of yourself do you need to let go of? What part have you elevated? What part of yourself has you, have you elevated so high it becomes a defining trait in your life? It begins to drive the bus. And Jesus is given the back seat. What part is it in your life? Because for the only way for us to, to combat this American idol of individualism is to know how it's affected us. To know what parts of ourself we're putting up on the throne. We've turned into little counterfeit gods. And I want to be a church that worships God above all else. I want you guys to be people that worship God above ourselves. I want to be a person that worships God above myself. And I've got 45 years worth of conditioning <laughs> to reverse. We've all got some years of conditioning to reverse. But the only solution for that if you want to call yourself a Christian is to accept the death to self sentence that Jesus gives. That's the entrance to the relationship. And so maybe you have, maybe you haven't. The truth is this really isn't an either or. It's more like a Either or, either or, either or, either or, either And that's just the first hour of my day. <laughs> I think that's a little more realistic about how it works. So as, as you go through the rest of today, as you go through the rest of the week, I want you to remember that if you, if you identify as a Christian, if you have said, I am following God with my life, you have accepted a death to self sentence with no chance of getting out. But you know what? That sounds pretty ominous, doesn't it? The governor's not going to call at midnight. Okay? But, remember Jesus' words. The more we accept that death to self-sentence, the more we win. The more we're built up, the more we're nourished, the more we're saved, the more we're, we're given life. Paradox of Christian life. Accept the death to self sentence and you live. Reject the death to self sentence and you actually die. Let's be a church that accepts our death sentence. Because nowhere else in life does a death sentence lead to life. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge on behalf of Room Life Church, on behalf of myself and my family, I acknowledge and accept the death to self-sentence that you've given me, you've given my family, and you've given, given this church, those who have chosen to follow you. Lord, I pray that this becomes, this is a congregation full of people dying to themselves. Lord, so I pray for strength, I pray for courage as we face the selfish parts of our life. As we sit and as we face the, the me-first attitudes of our heart. Give us eyes to see what's inside us 
and the courage to believe your statement that there is another way. And that other way actually leads to more life, more fullness, more satisfaction. Lord, let us believe that. Please help us believe that to be true. So God, I thank you. I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you that he died for us. Lord, I thank you that you love us, not for anything that we do, but exactly for who we are, your creation. I promise in the name of Jesus, the one who brings us life.